Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance upon us, and we shall be saved. In the name of the one who was, and is, and is to come. Amen. So here we are again on the first Sunday of Advent. Things look a little bit different up here. The hangings are no longer that plain green we had grown weary of. This deep blue, beautiful color we love wearing reminds us of the Blessed Virgin Mary in art and in iconography. I didn't get that at the early service either. Iconography. I practice it all during the forum. Maybe I was going to get it right. Yes, it used to be that we used purple for Advent too when this uh, shortened season was a mini Lent, but things changed in the church slowly. We are less focused on penitence and more focused on hope and expectation of the Savior who will come to save us. Deep blue is the color of the pre-dawn sky, the color that covers the earth in the hours before the sun rises in the east. It symbolizes the other reminder of Christ's second coming, of which he speaks in the gospel. Sure, penitence and spiritual discipline should be part of our Advent observance. That is why many of us use an Advent wreath or devotional calendars to mark the days of Advent. It is a time, of course, to recommit our faith to God, no matter what the color. Hopefully we will be comforted and encouraged to keep watch for the promised light of Christ that will come into the world, breaking over the horizon, changing the night into day, darkness into light, filling our lives with a holy and righteous splendor. That all sounds like last year's sermon on the first Sunday of Advent, though. And quite frankly, I get bored pretty easily. For some reason, I just don't feel like going down that road of chastising you for giving in a little to the culture of Christmas that began so early these days. I confess, I went to the mall on Black Friday, albeit just to buy some jigsaw blades from Sears. I've already bought some presents online. I'm going to put my tree up this week and decorate outside. Yes, we Christians are called to be countercultural with our celebrations. Enjoy it. Live a little. Spread some Christmas cheer. But we won't be singing any Christmas carols in this church until Christmas Eve, lest the liturgical police come after David and me for the citation. <laughs> but all that language of waiting and preparing and expectation just seem a bit tired to me. I apologize. So I was moved by the words of Isaiah. And one word from the psalmist this week. Restore. Restore. Restore us, O God of hosts. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Maybe it excited me because I like to do projects in our basement workshop, restoring furniture, bringing back things that were a little shoddy, bringing them back to life. I like to give a second chance that big warehouse down from our beloved casino. They have the neatest old stuff in there looking for a new purpose. Old fireplaces, columns, cabinets, furniture, lighting, I've got a light fixture there. I love finding this stuff and giving it a new purpose. Last week I got an old silver chest I'm going to sand down and polish. Also got a silver bowl. I love to polish silver. It's a Therapeutic somehow. I've shared that uh, joy with Harold in the back. Something that looks old is brought to new life, restored. You ever tried that trick? I bought this bowl, it was pitch black, and you um, put aluminum foil in the bottom of the sink and boil some water and put baking soda in there and then pour the water over it, and the tarnish slowly comes off of the bowl and ends up on the aluminum foil. Put some elbow grease and polish after you pull it out of the water and buff it to a shine with that good old retired undershirt. Perfect for the mashed potatoes on our Thanksgiving table. It is a joyful practice to me. 
Restore us, O God of hosts. I sat glued to the television along with millions of others after there was no indictment in Ferguson, Missouri this week. I was not surprised, but I was horrified as the media almost sought out the tear gas and wanted cars to be destroyed and fires to be lit. With all of the hype and expectation, despite pleas to the contrary, it was inevitable. Restore us, O God of hopes. As I drove my parents around town last week, they said, you have more beggars and homeless people than we have ever seen in our lives. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. People rush to the stores now open on Thanksgiving, hoping to take advantage of great deals, fulfill their lives by giving or receiving the perfect gift, hoarding more stuff, people posting their videos from their cell phone cameras of the brawls that ensued at the Walmart over the subwoofers that were a great deal, evidently. Studies show that kids really just want their parents to put down their cell phones and spend some more time with them working on a project in the basement or teaching them how to make mashed potatoes, tossing the football, snuggling up with a good book. Restore us, O oh God of hosts. One commentator says Psalm 80 is kind of this national lament, which for those of us in the United States or any other modern nation, doesn't seem to make much sense since we all come from different faith backgrounds and pray in different ways or not at all. But even those of us with a shared faith, prayer has become so individualistic. Even though we know deep down in that our problems and our hope rest in a more corporate reality. Psalm 80 pictures this northern kingdom of Israel in panic mode over the impending invasion of the Assyrians. This fledgling kingdom doesn't have a prayer, or perhaps that is all they have left. But once they were crushed, and 150 years later, when the exile snuffed out any hope of national presence, the presence of God was all they had. Then the wisest theologians learned that was enough. And so might we. Isaiah's words will work too if you like those better, God. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so the mountains would quake. You used to shine your face upon us. Remember that time back at Mount Sinai? You used to send your power down like an earthquake. We followed you in the cloud and the pillar of fire by night. Don't be angry with us anymore. We've suffered enough. We'll turn and follow you if you just restore us. I like Isaiah and the words of the psalmist because they break it down and make it real. They get honest with God. They plead with God. They know they have no other prayer. <coughs> So this Advent, I wonder what would happen if we do the same. Begging God to restore us and shine down upon us. Sure, it does seem easier when we don't have to confront the collection of all the messes of our lives and of our society. But could it be that in our unknowing, we ignore the reality of the holy all around us? as we go our way. Could it be that we, like the Israelis of Isaiah's time, do not see or experience God because we do not practice God's presence enough? And by practice, I mean intentional focus. I mean daily prayer. I mean struggling and striving each and every moment to live life on purpose in the presence of the one who created us. What if it is our job to restore ourselves and society and our world? 
Think of what it would mean for us to live a life on purpose, fully aware that God is, in fact, right here already. Emmanuel. Present and also on his way back. How would our personal behavior change if we knew that was going to be tomorrow? How would your spiritual life change? What would happen if we opened our whole being up to that incredible growing presence of God? No more denial, no more hiding, no more hunching down in the ground hoping no one will notice that you're a Christian, secretly celebrating a season marked by the color blue instead of red and green, a season of preparing for the one who will come to restore the whole creation. So that is what excites me about the season. It is not boring to me. We get to gather together as a community to raise one bold voice that is very countercultural, asking God to listen. We know we have sinned God and we confess, but we are a people of faith in you, strong enough to handle our anger and anything we can throw at you. We are a bold community that was named Nativity for a reason. Courageous enough to ask you here in this place for help. Together we know and proclaim what we know from our experience in this world, torn by strife. And we trust in you to restore your covenant with us, O oh God. And finally, we have figured out that we will only be restored by getting out there and restoring other people. With our prophetic voice as a Christian community, we proclaim that discrimination based on our color or background or neighborhood of origin is not acceptable. There is a better way. Hunger and homelessness are not a given. More stuff will not bring us glory or satisfaction. Restore us, O oh God of hosts. Let your face shine that we might be saved from ourselves. We have done better in the past, but this is not a season to reminisce and try to restore our perfect ways of being in holidays of years gone by. We are tempted to look back, but God only looks ahead into a deep pre-dawn blue sky, the color that covers the earth in the hours before the sun rises in the east. His son, our savior, who will be born in a manger. His light cast away the works of darkness, and when we decide to put on the armor of light, we shall truly be restored.